no real surprise for those who've tried to read Durkheim to be told that he's a difficult thinker. He's a thinker who is very demanding of, of his readers and has also written a great deal. So there's a lot of material which involves a lot of hard work if you're going to understand him in, his, in all his complexity. And complexity is important because Durkheim himself recognized that reality is an extremely complex phenomenon when we're talking about the reality of the social world. So Durkheim's work, not surprisingly, is open to many different interpretations. And one of the things that myself and a number of other colleagues have tried to do is to read him very rigorously to try and find out what his major arguments are, but also to notice the places where his work is, uh, is a little bit obscure or, co or contradictory. And the purpose of doing this is to try and find out if there, are, if there is an overlap of discourses or, if you like, propositions in his work which sometimes complement each other and sometimes contradict each other. The, reason, the, the point of doing that again is to try and disentangle in his work various themes and various forms of argument. And, and again, to do that, the, the purpose of doing that is to open up the possibilities of developing them in, a, in, a, in a different directions. So there are conventional ways of reading suicide, for example, conventional ways of reading the division of labor in society, of reading the rules of sociological method. And that, but any of these texts can be reread by, by looking at them as, as the products of a particular period of Durkheim's writing and thinking, but with aspects of them which are a little bit, shall we say, ragged or, or loose. And these other bits can be then taken up and perhaps formulated into something rather different. Now, just to give you a couple of examples, um, a simple example first. If you look at Durkheim's discussion of myth and, and ritual and what he discussed in the, sorry, in the um, rules of sociological method as the, the, the conscience collectiva at work, you'll find that generally speaking, people would think of something like royalty and royalty ceremonies as integrative into society, for society. And indeed, in the 1950s, two sociologists in England, Edward Schulz and, and um, I can't remember the second one's name for the moment, um, wrote, wrote a study of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, in which they basically argued that it provided an opportunity of people in Britain forgetting class differences and having a sense of unity as one body. Now, that's quite, quite an interesting way of thinking about something massive, like, like a like a, a, a ceremony in, 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 the, uh, in the country as a whole, it's being very similar in some ways to what happens with a small group of people who might celebrate somebody. So in some sense, Durkheim's thinking already gives you this sense of scale, where you can start from somewhere small and go somewhere very large, and very similar things apply. Now, what's interesting here, though, is that there have been a number of recent events which we see a, something of a replication of the same uh, situation but with different, rather different outcomes. And the fact that they are different is what makes them interesting. An example is the, is the death and funeral of Princess Di. Now this happened at a particular occasion when there was something of a crisis in the country about the monarchy. There was clearly a lot of people were dissatisfied with the way that Princess Di had been treated. And when she died, tragically, at first, this created a great deal of resentment against the queen because it was believed that she hadn't treated Diana appropriately. But subsequently, with, with Tony Blair's phrase, which he developed and used, the people's princess, ironically, this turned, to, turned into something which legitimated monarchy again. And the reason why it did it was it looked like the queen was re re repentant for her ill conduct, and therefore she was once again acting like a real queen. Now, that's a description I'm giving now, which was from, from a rather conservative to a viewpoint. But it's very easy to make that into something much more radical by thinking in slightly different terms. One of the things that Durkheim talks about in the division of labor and society is the quite startling implications of having a society which is supposed to be meritocratic, but which is, has inherited wealth as an intrinsic part of the way it works. Durkheim argues in the division of labor that organic solidarity, which is, which is based upon people of roughly equal situations exchanging services for each other and specializing to everybody's benefit, such a society, he believes, is, is very spontaneously solidaristic because people are doing things for each other while they're doing things for themselves. 
And there is also potentially a meritocratic society, Durkheim argues. That is to say that people will achieve, have got the, the, the possibility of achieving their particular goals, their particular skills. But, but Durkheim argues, and this is again where I said where the radical things come in very clearly, he argues that this is not possible if you have what he calls the forced division of labor. And the forced division of labor occurs when people cannot get to the position that they deserve because there are others already in that position who are blocking their possibility. And people who do not have the, the same qualifications or potential qualifications as those who are excluded. And Durkheim says the major source of this in a society is the forced division of labor, which is, which is an effect of the inheritance of wealth. In other words, when families can hand on, down wealth down the family tree, this creates for each new generation an unfair advantage over others. And let's see the way this works. There's a number of different ways it works. First of all, it's possible that people can buy access to the control of significant amounts of industrial uh, capital and therefore control large, large enterprises, not based at, so that they end up in a position of responsibility and authority and indeed decision-making without actually having any personal merit or with, with relatively little personal merit, but precisely because their parents own large, large amounts of stock. So other people who might be better able to, to direct an enterprise at that moment are excluded from the possibility of doing such a thing. Another way that this occurs is a straightforward subsidy of particular activities in a way which benefits some and others cannot benefit in the same way because they're not equally subsidized. And the classic example of this particular phenomenon is that in, Eng in England when barristers, that's lawyers who practice uh, as advocates in the, in the, in the, uh, in the courts, barristers uh, do not get paid for the first two years after they, after they um, qualify as a barrister. It's not a formal rule, but it's in practice that people are very slow in paying their bills. What this actually means in practice then is that not only is going to become to school to become a barrister expensive, but once you become a barrister, you've got to be able to support yourself for a couple of years without getting any income at all. Now, a few people can do that, so that's, a, that's the second way in which this uh, uh, plays out. A third way it plays out is with a much more important thing that contemporaneously is ed with education where people can buy a better quality of education if they have more money. Now, I'm not saying all private schools are better than other schools, but what is really bought when people send their children to private schools is, is the classroom size. First of all, the classroom size, and second, the contacts. Now, if you have a particular set of schools which have smaller classrooms and, and better tuition than other ones, the people who can send their children to those schools are, are, are at an advantage. It's like the other people are, are running a race with... with, with one arm tied behind their backs when, they're, when, they're, when they should be swinging both arms. So again, if we look at something which starts off looking relatively, relatively uh, closed and tight, we find that re reading, reading it carefully, we discover that Durkheim's got quite a significant radical potential.